Well, we've been talking about learning. We've been talking about things. We've been talking about, we studied uh, Paul and the ordinances he gave the church in Corinthians. It's divided churches, doctrine. People have taken it and built their own little doctrines about it. But uh, I wrote at the top of this, Gary, on September 1st, 23. And I write things Gary says down. The Lord speaks to Gary. We're driving down 35, and uh, we'd been up here like, working at the church, and I was driving home, and all of a sudden Gary said, do you know what theory means? When he says that, I know I'm fixing to get a word from the Lord because the Lord will give him things that he don't know. He said, do you know what theory means? And I said, well, I think so. I said, why, what'd you hear? He said, I just heard in my spirit, just, and he didn't say in my spirit, because I just got that little voice all of a sudden and said, the theory of me, he said, God. That's weird. The theory of me. I was like, well, I don't know. I'll have to write that one down, think about it. I said, he told me about like me, my theory, he goes, all I know is theory of me, and then it's like God, like dash God. What do you do with that? Well, I hope I'm going to do a lot with it. Or he's going to do it. Because I got back that afternoon, I was, or that night, I was sitting out there on the swing, and I actually have an Alexa now outside with me. I love it. I can listen to music and ask her things. And I said, you know, Alexa, what does theory mean? And um, there's a lot of stuff in it. That the first, it says an, an idea or a set of ideas that is intended to explain facts or events. A theory, it's an idea or a set of ideas that's intended to explain facts or events. I have a theory about that. There's scientific theories, right? What is one that the first one popped in my mind was the theory of, what? There's gravity. Well, no, I'm going to go. It's the theory of evolution. It's funny you said that because I put down that actually the difference, a theory of evolution, evolution is a theory, but really there is, the, it's not a theory of gravity because gravity is a proven fact. A theory has some missing holes in it. That's why it's called a theory. But gravity can be scientifically, it's a pretty simple one. If I crawl on top of this house right now and I jump off, what is going to happen 100%? It's the law of gravity. It's been established. I'm going to go down. I'm not going to just levitate there like my little hummingbirds. I love those hummingbirds. They stop. I'm like, how did you do that? I was watching them this morning. Watching the hummingbirds with the, it's so heavenly. And the sun is starting to come up. I was watching those hummingbirds. Just see the shadow. I couldn't, you know. It's, 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 a, it's a law of gravity because it's can be proven. But theories are things. And why is it the theory of evolution? The truth is now in school, they don't usually say theory of it. They just say evolution. They don't even hardly, it's just like a given now. It's like a given. It's like, oh, you know that. You know that we came from the Big Bang or we came from some cosmic. We believe. That. And so there's all these things. They're really teaching it like it's not. And I'll tell young people, I say, no, wait a minute. That's a theory. They're trying, to, they're trying to come up with a fact that we exist. That's an event. That's a fact. So they come up with theories of why is man here? How did man get here? There's all kinds of theories. But a theory is something that you think you, you've got a lot of facts, but there's still just something that causes it to be called a theory. And if you study the theory of evolution, which I did in college, I, I, I saw that they, they don't want to say it, but there's some missing links in there. Because the theory is that we all came from the ocean, really. We come from the waters. We crawled out a little amoeba, amoeba and that even started with a, some cosmic problem, blast up there. But there's some things they've not proven. They can't do this jump from this to this. So there's some missing holes. They're still looking. Archaeologists are still digging. But they really can't prove that man came from the ocean or from what happened in some cosmic situation. It's why it's called Darwin's theory of evolution. There's still some unexplained parts. How many of y'all know we have some theories of God? 
we have some ideas of God. But the truth is, there's all these theories that people, a lot of time we call them doctrines. You go to this church, this is what, this is about God. This is what God looks like. You go to this church, oh, that's what God looks like. You go over here and you, and you study uh, Islam and they're going to tell you this is what God looks like. You're going to start up here, you're going to go to some new age something. This is what God looks like. They actually can end up create, worshiping the creation more than the creator. They, they start worshiping Mother Earth and nature, not the one who created it. So this whole thing, the theory of me, has just set me on a uh, uh, quest and realizing that there's so many things that we have that are theories about God. And, I, and I'm like, God, I, I realize that the only way, the way something comes from a theory to a law of gravity, from theory of this, is through, uh, it's when they start experimenting in labs. They actually start doing that stuff. People really jump off of things to say, yep, gravity, this is what happens. And they try the pull of the earth and they look at all this stuff. And so there's things, it takes experience to go from a theory to this is a truth to something that's proven. I think today what's happening is that God is bringing, to, there's a word that's kind of a buzzword right now, a lot, a lot of religious circles, and I'm hearing it. And it's the word deconstruction. Y'all heard deconstruction? We're in deconstruction. Now, I've been hearing it in the, some of the threads and some of the people I'm talking. I haven't talked about a lot in here. But the truth is, ever since for 12 years as pastor in this church, I've been doing a lot of deconstruction. I've been trying to say, I'm, I don't, you don't know I'm doing it, but instead of tearing down and saying, that's not what we believe, that's not what we believe. No, I've just been saying, this is what I found to be true. But in saying, I found this to be true, the truth is I'm leading us away from stuff that we have was taught. I walked in this church believing a lot of stuff about God, about the Bible, about Jesus, that I had been deconstructing and going, that's not really right. There's a lot of things that I thought was right, a lot of things. And boy, it changed me a few years ago when all of a sudden I started realizing, and I've been talking about it, that a lot of things I was taught, this is the truth. We have the truth. This is what it takes to go to heaven. This is what the gospel is. This is how you should dress. This is how you should walk. This is what he says about marriage and divorce. This is what he said about women in ministry. This is what he said about that. And all these things that I had to come in and he's been shaking me for some years. And when I started to realize that I had that wrong, you know what it did? It caused me to start questioning everything. Oh, that's scary. But it was, had to be okay. Because I wanted to know truth. I didn't want just a bunch of man's theory. I want to know what God says about it. And what happened is shaking started happening in my personal life. And I guarantee some of you have had some shaking through your years to shake off some old thoughts that I really thought God was mad at me all the time. I really felt like God was always disappointed in Pam. If I wasn't doing anything wrong, I, I, if I wasn't sinning by admission, I was sinning by omission. I was just not praying enough. It wasn't enough that I'm not out here uh, gonna start, you know, doing all this stuff we called sin. But I was sinning because I just wasn't praying enough or fasting enough. I just didn't. And I was never enough. And that is a lie. It's a theory of revolution that's brought people into bondage for years. And they just never feel like I can really, they have no confidence in God because they feel like he said their condemnation makes them shy back I really don't want to do that I really don't feel like I get ready to teach Sunday school yet or I'm not really realizing I can go speak to my neighbor because my neighbor heard me cussing yesterday or my or this happened or that happened and I'm I'm living in the condom I can't even be me I can't even be used of God because these theories we've got in our mind about who God is we're trying to explain facts. We're trying to figure things out. But I'm telling you what, there's a deconstruction going on. And the Bible calls it a shaking. And it was prophesied it was going to happen. Paul talks about it in Hebrews. He's writing to the Israelites there, the Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 26 through 29. And he's going to quote the Old Testament. He's going to talk about He said, whose voice shook the earth. And now has promised saying, yet once more will I shake the earth. But not just the earth, but heaven's only. Heaven, what is heaven? It's the spiritual realm. 
And this word, yet, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things which are shaken. It's going to show you. You're going to see the signs of some things that are being removed that can shaken of the things that are made. They're man-made. Things that are man-made can be shaken. He said, but those things which, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. He's shaking us on down to what really matters. He's shaking off a lot of theories of man and religion to say what can be shaken. That doesn't stand up. Things which could, that may remain. Therefore, we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. That's what I'm looking for. I want a kingdom, a kingship, that realm that cannot be moved. Let us have grace then. This is what cannot be moved. Yes, have grace whereby we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now those scriptures used to be beat me over the head with them. Well, why, why all this good stuff up here now? All of a sudden you're going to come. You want to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear because our God's a consuming fire. I discovered about that fire business. If it said my God is a consuming fire, that means fire is a good thing. We're going to figure this out. In theory, we had fire as punishment. Fire is refining. Fire is purification. Fire brings light. Fire was the only light in the Bible, the sun and the flame fire brings light. So if he said, our God is a consuming fire, I see that now as a positive thing. Now I'm able to serve him acceptedly with reverence, not fear, not, not afraid of him. I'm not scared of him, but that godly fear is in awe. I'm in awe of you, but also remember you're consuming fire. So I want you, I'm saying, I want the fire of the Holy Ghost to purify me. I don't want myself in again when I keep walking around the loser loop, losing everything I got again because I'm walking against him. I'm not walking in reference. This ain't no, some people say, greasy gracious, do what you want to do. Oh, just do what you're going to do. You can do what you're going to do, but I'm going to tell you something. You will not escape the consequences of that because our God is a consuming fire and he's a loving God. And he's saying, you need to be in awe because I'm trying to get you. I'm trying to take you and put you in the fire because I see you as gold. The only thing you put in gold, a fire is gold. You put gold in there and silver to purify it. If you're in the fire, it's because he loves you. And he's like, I see good in you. I see good in you, Christine. I see stuff in you, honey. You're going to go through some things. Trenton, you're going through some things. God sees gold in you. You put gold in the fire to purify it. You don't put it in there because you hate it. God hates me. How many people feel like God hates them because they're in, they're in hell? We don't understand. People, I, I, oh my gosh. I read something, a, a, a lady that I know, I don't, I, I don't want to get all these. I get, I, I get very serious about things. So I deal with the seriousness. I deal with hurting people. It's real. I had a mother write, it was the anniversary of her son that had hung himself at 16. It was his second year anniversary. And she was riding in there and she said, I, I, I accepted the Lord. I walked with God and I thought I missed hell, but I am in hell. She said, I have gnashing of teeth. I was like, you just said it. I have gnashing of teeth. I cannot sleep. I'm consumed with the visions of seeing him hang there. I'm consumed with it. Let me tell you something. I found out something else's theory. There was a, they said there's a phrase. It's called in theory. What does in theory mean? It's used describing what is supposed to happen or is supposed to be possible in theory, but usually with the implication that it, in fact, it doesn't happen. It's like saying in theory, things can only get better, but in practice, they may very well become worse. You hear anybody say in theory, this is going to happen. But in reality, it's not what's happening. In theory, I got all my ducks in a row. In theory, I ought to be able to stop doing that. In theory, I ought to be able to get up and put that uh, alarm on and get up and do this thing. You know, I, I used to be like, oh, uh, he's, these people used to be early. I mean, I was like, I'm going to get up. I'm going to pray for an hour. I'm like, God, forgive me. I failed on that so many times. 
I don't know. I mean, it's like torture. We finally, we thought we were supposed to pray. In theory, you're supposed to pray an hour. Why? Where do we get that? Because Jesus said in the garden, it's not because we make stuff up. But we make theories out of stuff. We take it out of context and make it a doctrine and make it a dogma. Which is a man's opinion is what a dogma is. It's in a well-established man's opinion is what a dogma is. It became a dogma that you pray an hour. Because in the garden, Jesus told his disciples, can you not tarry with me one hour? What happened? They wanted to. They meant to. I wanted to. I meant to. But right in there somewhere, he looks over there. <laughs> Even when he brought the Peter, James, and John, his three amigos, his closest buddies, closest, he took them further with him. Even they went to sleep. I used to beat myself up. Oh, they did that as before the Holy Ghost came. After I got the Holy Ghost day at Pentecost, I ought to be able to pray an hour. People go, I had to pray. I'm like, God bless you. I love you. Pray for me during that hour. I'll give you some stuff to pray about, but I have a heart. I just to be honest with you. We made them dogma. We made them things, expectations. I felt like I didn't please him if I didn't make it the hour. We had prayer chains. My mom and daddy used to take the hardest because nobody else wanted them. Mama talks about her and daddy. They take like two to three and three to four. He'd take an hour. She took an hour. They'd get up and pray, God bless them. But we actually, to be able to make that hour, we made what we call a prayer circle. I found one other day stuck in one of my Bibles. And there's nothing wrong with this. Don't get me wrong. But this is what we can get. It said 15 minutes praise. We broke it up in 15 minutes. Some of them just five minutes. So you'd know how to pray to make it that hour. We gave you a list of things to pray about. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It can help be helpful. But the truth is it was based upon a dogma. That we made it doctrine. We really, but it was those things. This is just accepted. It's, it's a well accepted opinion that you need to be able to do this. What I'm finding out in reality, people were probably doing what I was doing. Falling asleep somewhere in that hour and then feeling really guilty. It created guilt. It created expectations because it sounded right. In theory, Gary should be healed by now. I know all the scriptures on healing. If there's anything that I have gr grappled with or struggled with over the years, it's phys physically heal physical healing. Why is that healed one? That healed, that one's not healed. Oh, there's all kind of doctrine out there about that one. It's because who you align myself up with. Is it my faith? Is it your faith? Is it whatever? Is it, it's, it's just all over the place. And, and you can feel real guilty because you ain't healed. Why didn't God heal us? I'm not going to sit here and make up my own theory about that. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm just going to trust him and walk with him. And I've tried a lot and I will continue. There's, we need to continue learning. And I know God is revealing things to us. But let me tell you something. I've learned along the way that his ways are not my ways. His ways is above my ways. His thoughts are above my thoughts. And he knows exactly what I need. And that's what I trust him in. That's why I say in all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge the Lord and trust you to go direct my path. If there's some prayer I need to pray, I need to get somebody to lay hands on me, not lay hands on me. Lose oil, don't use oil, uh, confess it. Uh, don't let anybody come in the room that doesn't have negative faith. I mean, has you know, I, I've been through all of those things. In theory, we should all be healthy sitting here. In theory, we should be all so mature and so great. In theory, this church should be full. But in reality, it's not. And you know what I walk into then? The theory of me. Now I start dissecting me. Now I start self-analyzing me. What kind of pastor are you? When those people came and left. 
Oh, have anybody here beside me? You want to deconstruct yourself. You're sitting there looking at yourself. We're analyzing ourselves. the theory of me being Pam. What do I think about me? He's been deconstructing that about us too. He's trying to bring us on down. What I think about me is different than what God thinks about me. At some point, I'm going to say, Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. And not only that, because he's been there for me through hell and hot water. I know some things. It's like being in the lab. I've experienced some things and that's no longer a theory for me. That's what I know. It's the law of love. In fact, he's called it that. The law of liberty. I don't live under the law of, of, of law of the, the law of sin and shame and all of that. I don't live under that. I live under the law of liberty. Now I'm free. He that the son is set free. His son is free indeed. And he set me free. And now he set me free. Then also now to learn some other stuff. My spirit is free, but what's not free all the time is my mind, will, and emotion. It's my soul. It's called the saving or the deliverance of the soul. And we're all going through it. He's saving my soul every day. He's delivering me. That's nothing to do with the afterlife. It's like right now, this life. He's trying to get me delivered of me, my lies in my head about God, about me, about you, about what it looks like to be successful. I heard a preacher talk, he goes, there's a difference in being successful. He was at a pastor's conference. He said, I'm telling you, it's a difference in a successful pastor and somebody that is belovedly significant. Belovedly significant. I said, that's the kind of pastor I want to be. That's the kind of Pam I want to be. That's the kind of mama I want to be. That's the kind of grandma I want to be. The kind of neighbor I want to be. I want to be, I want to be belovedly significant. I want to be significant in my world, Mary. I want to be significant to you, belovedly not because I've got all my theology right. There's probably things I say and I have to go back later. Like, well, I didn't really have that right. I've said, no, but I reserve the right to grow, Melissa. Aren't you glad we've grown a lot? You've watched me grow. What looks like growth, some people thought, oh, look at her. Oh, look at that woman. Preaching in pants. God forgive her. I don't know how the fire of God ain't here. You just zapped her down. We meant well. You know what I'm talking about. Preaching in pants. Oh, Lord Jesus. I'll tell you. But you know what? Where our hearts was right. But I've got people all over the world right now that's trying to be successful, but they ain't really being belovedly significant. Sam, you're belovedly, belovedly significant. I'm saying again, Sam. You are belovedly significant. You matter. I'm glad you're alive. I'm glad you did not die. When you ask the question, why did they die when they tried to kill themselves? They accomplished it and I didn't. Why am I alive and they're not? Because you're belovedly significant. I don't know. That your uncle's okay. He's in heaven. He's all right. You're just not okay. But God has got you here because you're significant. You're significant to this world. You're belovedly significant. Marty, you're belovedly significant, not just to your babies, your kids, your wife, but to me in this church. We matter. It doesn't always look like you think it's going to look. It doesn't always look like you think it's going to look. When we, when we receive the responsibility, that's all it is, of this church, which was going to, nobody wanted it. The doors were going to close because it had a $250,000 note on it. I mean, there was really no people left. There was no money coming in every week. I said, well, we'll do what we can. We're not going to let that place go down because we're part of the beginning, even though we've been gone for some years. But he said to me, and you've heard me say it, I had to go back to what he said. Now, remember, I've taught the three R's. When you're in a hard time, what you do, you recall beginning. Why am I doing this to start why? Why did I marry this person? Why did I start this business? Why did I join this church? What was the beginning? Was that God or not? Recall the beginning and the second one, remember what he's done in between. Remember all the victories, remember. And the last R is remain, remain in the game, remain. But I remember what he's told me. He said, I've got wounded, 
wandering and weary sheep in this area. I need you to shepherd them. Brother Art, tell me, Brother Art Rogers, who's passed on. He said, the Lord said, I picked Pam and Gary because you, I could trust you with my sheep. He knew we love hard. We love long. But also what we realize, and Brother Ken has helped me so many times, we have got these wonderful elders. Brother Gary, we're so glad Gary's back today. Hallelujah, praise God. He should have been dead. He just went through triple bypass. Look at you. I love you, Brother Gary. I'm glad you're here. Thank God it still got thought through with you. You could be in glory land right now. I'm glad you're not. I'm glad you're here. Sorry. But Brother Ken coined out a hospital. People, they come to a hospital. They don't just hang out forever in the hospital. You get healed and move on. He said, you have a gift. My gift is the gift of a surgeon. I'm really good in triage. I'm really good when you need a surgeon to go, this, get this out. I'm real good in emergencies. It's my gifting. I'm not so good as administrator. And I'm also not a real good nurse. I'm not the person that I, 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 I just have this thing. I'm not the person I should be. I should on myself all the time. I should have been at the hospital. I should have been sending flowers. I should have sent those flowers to that funeral. I forgot. I should have been seeing that person. I should have called on that person. Should, should, should. But have, I think he showed me, you're not going to be good at everything, Pam. But every hospital, it ain't all on the surgeon. It's not all on the administrator. You also have, you also nurses in that hospital. You also have, you have somebody that's going to clean up and be, going to clean up the rooms. You have people that's going to work on the finances. So it takes a team to run a hospital at all I just need some of you stay along stay enough to help me do those things because they're going to keep coming through this house and hopefully they're going to get healed they're going to get delivered and they're going to go on and do stuff other places and I've got probably thousands by now that's been through here that's been healed and using the gifts that I have and they're out there doing other things but what I need to some people are just going to stick around I'd like when when brother uh, David came come to my house the first time his daughter was in a horrible, horrible time of her life. We could make a lifetime movie. I'm telling you what they've gone through. In the middle of all that, she was being healed. In the middle of her healing. In the middle of abuse. In the middle of murder. Abuse. I mean, all kind of stuff that just, you did, just, it just don't even should happen, little tales. She said, I have a daddy. She hadn't been, a, she wasn't part of your life, was she, much, David? He was an addict. She was a little girl that always said, I would see him when he come paid his child support. I want him just to come pat me on the head. She said, I'm going to go get my daddy. He's homeless in Grand Prairie, Texas. Can I just say this? We all sit around my house and go, okay. I'm thinking, what are we going to do with this man? <laughs> We're helping her buy her diapers. We're helping her do stuff. She's in a subsidized apartment. She can't bring her daddy. She goes, I, I just got to go find my daddy. It's okay. Living in a, somebody's basement trying to, you know. Called a man named Terry. Terry, I got somebody. I honor Terry Edwards. Started brother's house. Can I get him in? He did. We did, didn't we, David? How many years you've been sober now? Six and a half years. Homeless, broken man. Running our sound back there. I honor you, brother. Greeting people. Let me tell you what works in theory. Let me tell you what works in reality. Is love. Everything else is theory. We're just working on it. We're trying to find all the answers. But I know what works. And I just read you that scripture where he said that there's going to be a shaking and the things that are going to, so that the things that are real, they're going to remain. I see Christianity going through a shaking. We went through the dark ages. It got to the point where you couldn't even own a Bible. I, I was, I Googled some of that stuff this morning and, and uh, it, it come a time I know it said, uh, 
one of these things. He said, the second council of Tarragona in, in 1234, the Spanish bishops, according to the degree of King James I of Aragon, declared that it was forbidden for anyone to have own a translation of the Bible. They had to be burned within eight days, or otherwise, otherwise they were considered heretics. They had to go take that Bible and burn it. He had eight days, or you then would be burned as a heretic. That's where we came from. This is the dark age. This is where people didn't have it. It says throughout the medieval times of the English church, when it was governed by Rome, by the Pope, over, all over the Christian world, church services were conducted in Latin, and it was illegal to translate the Bible into local languages. This is just Google. This is not a religious thing. This is just the facts of history. We came from that. We came from a time where people didn't own Bibles. They didn't, and they were told what to do, and they were controlled by everything to hear. Because they, and so all these theories came out, and things started happening that they, they started controlling the world with fear. Y'all know that. They wouldn't really convert the Indians. They just wanted to come and take over their villages. It was down there in the Incas. They thought there was gold. So they just was, you know, you know history. They took, they put, did the crusades with crosses on their backs, fighting. They wouldn't try to go over there and re recruit the, or bring God, Christianity to the Moors. They wanted their, they wanted their spices. They, study it. They wanted their land. They used religion and, and God to conquer the world. There's nothing any more deadly. You get politics and religion mixed together, and it is powerful. Majority of the world, w wars, comes down. The dogma, people's ideas, what they think about God, but in their carnality, they've twisted it. They've twisted it. And so I realized, I don't know where I'm at on these papers. I ain't nowhere on the paper, so y'all just hold on to me. But he said, there's some things that's going to be shaken. And I saw this meme. I was going to go back and look at it. But they're saying there's no such thing as progressive Christianity. If it's progressive Christianity, it's not Christianity at all. I go, I go what are you talking about? No, there's no such. I hope we're progressing. Because we regress to that. Where nobody could even own a Bible. And you were using religion to control the world. What's happening now? We're coming out of all that old stuff. We're progressing out of the dark ages back into the new church. It's a circle that's going on. We're getting closer and closer to the end of this thing. Where the, we're going back to what the first church looked like. We're shaking off a lot of the old stuff that came out of all of our denominations. He's shaking us off and bringing us back down to the, pure, the purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I see happening. It don't always look like progression. Oh, you're trying to be progressive. I'm like, did you not know what Jesus said? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. He quoted this to the Satan. He said, but man will live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That means a proceeding means it's happening. It's not just what happened. It's preceding. He's constantly speaking to us. And he's constantly bringing us into his light of who he is. And the way you're going to know it's like being in the lab of life. All of a sudden, you're experiencing God. In theory, I shouldn't be doing this. In theory, I shouldn't be over there praying in an unknown tongue. But in reality, I do. Oh, in theory, that don't make sense to my logic. Honey, what, when did God ever work in logic? Yes. <sighs> Things he did never did was not, it wouldn't be a miracle if it was logic. He's trying to get us out of our natural thing and out of our logic, our carnal man, into the things of God to be able to walk in the spirit. I said last week in the hospital, I've been talking about my friend Bill, who had the motorcycle accident. He's been now, I guess, six, eight, six weeks or so uh, in the Bar Parkland uh, ICU burn unit because he, he was, he, the road rash was so bad. He's had multiple surgeries. They lost him twice. He's, he's affected his heart. He's been through, he's just been through. You're talking about hell and back. And, and we sit there with him and um, I sit there, I realize he's been going through some gnashing of teeth. When they scrub your wounds every day, the, you know, they had to do it. They try to, had to put him under to try to even scrub all of that off. You've been done like that. People in nurse, it's, it's a terrible thing to happen. And then he was having reactions affecting his heart when they were trying to put him under. So now I just, they can't, he's, in a, he's in a squeeze box of pain, physical pain. Also being there alone, his emotional things and a lot of things, those things, he's in that place. But it was one of the most precious visits he was able to set up. He looked good. Um, you know, he still has tubes all over him. He's do, still going through skin grafts and stuff. But he said, how did he say it? I'm, I wrote some of the things down here, but um, 
He says, I've sit here. He said, I've found that I've been reduced to the smallest little piece of me. It's like everything in my world is like. He goes, I realize it's all reduced to one thing that matters. What do y'all think that was? He said, love. Which is Jesus' is love personified. He said, it's just love. Because I find myself just looking at the nurses and looking at the doctors and looking at the, the aides and the custodians. Everybody comes through here. And I just see this person God loves. I'm speaking love to him. I'm speaking just how much God loves them and how precious they are. He goes, I don't know me. I'm just, it's just coming out of me. He said, I find myself pouring love and affection out to those that are serving me. He goes, I've got to the point, I've just laid aside all the doctrines of men I've studied and argued. There's nobody could argue theology. I really avoided him at times. I'm, I'm sorry, Bill, if you're listening, you probably are. Man, he could be contentious about the word. How many of y'all people that just study and they've always got something like way up here? You're like, uh, this sounds, uh, you're smarter than me. I'm trying to follow you with all of that. This and this, this, this. You know, he, he could do it. He had it. I love it. I mean, he was always in the word and he'd come through a terrible life, an addict, abuse. He came to a really hell life, but he got to the point where he became very religious. He said, all that's gone. He goes, I realize I've been trying to put God in some box of theology. God don't fit in a box. In theory, you ought to be able to do that. Let's just get this down right. We got the truth. We're line up on line. Oh, we, oh, we got all this stuff, honey. In theology, in, in, in the theory, you ought to be living it then. You ought to be the most spiritual, awesome person in the world. But you get around some of those highly religious people who have degrees all over. And let me tell you something. This is not something you're going to learn in seminary. This is something you're going to learn sometimes in the cemetery. It's in the lab of life. It stops being a theory and starts becoming the law of love. It reduces down. We're not throwing out doctrine. Y'all know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll let them tell you something. We have got doctrines of men that we're trying to substantiate. In theory, that should work. But in reality, where's the peace? It's like, remember the message I preached? Where's the beef? Some of y'all old enough to remember Wendy's. But where's the beef? I actually put the commercial up there. It looks all great, but where's the beef? When it really comes down to it, where's the beef? Where's where that really substantiates you? Do you leave church and really have peace and joy? Or do you leave church and pick up the fight with, that you left on the way? We can laugh and talk about that, but the reality is that's where so many people live. That's why a lot of our kids walked away from church because they saw how we really, really lived at home. We had it in theory, but we didn't really know how to walk it out at this point, how to really have Genuine love, relationship with God, that God is love. He said, I feel like I'm right now face to face with God. It's like he's in my face. He goes, there's like nothing between us in this hospital. It's the weirdest thing, Pam. He said, I'm just like face to face with him. And when I realized when you get to those places where you're stripped down and his, this is a physical pain and all these things he's going to, at that point, you will, you will release everything you have and just cling to the old rugged cross. Apostle Paul said, I don't even want to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. When they're taking the meat off your back, it's 39 stripes, three different times. You're floating around out in the ocean. We can talk about him, but you really want to talk. You see what he went through to write those letters. Tells me I've learned, and I'm going to talk about that. The things Paul learned. I've learned whatever state I find myself to be content. He learned it in some of the hardest places. I looked at Bill. I said, Bill, I really want what you got right now, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I hope I don't have to be in a Parkland Barn Center to learn it. I want to just learn it from you, dude. <laughs> I just, I, I just, just tell me some more because I don't want to go through this to learn it. I'm be honest. There's some things that we, we just have to learn the hard way because we just can't get it on our knees. We're not willing to start here. We have to wait till we're pushed on our knees. 
because we just keep doing life like I want to do life. I'm just going, this is my life. This, I'm, that, that ain't who I am. Are you, just is that, How you like that? How's it working for you, who you are? I really don't want to be who I, I want to be everything God says I can be. And I want to get beyond the theories of me that I think about myself when I think about God. And I want to be able to get to the point where he said, I am just at the place. I, it's, I'm just clinging to him. It's when you get to the place, you have no other recourse to, than to crawl to the throne to find grace. And I, and I, and I, I, and I was talking to somebody lately. And they didn't, uh, they didn't give me the answer I wanted to hear. Truth. If you ever had anybody tell you the truth, you're like, ooh. I really kind of need a little pity party there. That's not what I needed. But this person that loves me enough said, you know what Paul did? Paul asked the Lord to receive, to take that thorn in flesh away from him three different times. It didn't really, everybody surmises what that is. Whatever it was, it was, it was hurting. He was pushing him every time he moved. He said, he prayed three times. And I got to think about that three. I never talked about that three. I've talked about threes. Three times. That's, that's that, you know, that's that Father, Son, Holy Ghost, body, soul, spirit, death, burial, resurrection. It's the threes. It's, it's, it's all those threes. And that, the third is, is, is this ultimate place. The third, he said, he asked three times. And then what he said, this is interesting because, um, this is second Corinthians 12, eight through 10. He said, for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice it's three times that it might depart from me. But he said to me, I stop right there. God said something to him. He didn't go send the preacher over to him. He didn't get it off the YouTube bit of video. He didn't have those in. But, but he said he said something to me. Sometimes you just get to the place where you need to hear God speak to you. How many of y'all in this house have ever heard God speak to you? That little voice. You know it really wasn't your thought. You go, oh, that was not my thought. I ain't that smart. Now, I sure didn't. My mind don't even like what he said. But he said, here's what he said to me. My grace is sufficient for thee. For in my strength is made perfect, in my strength is made perfect in weakness. So then Paul said, because of that, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my weaknesses, my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I'll take pleasure. I ain't here yet. I'm sorry. I'm not Paul yet. Go look at this. I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I asked the Lord to take this thing away. And the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient. And when that person said that to me, I said, well, I, I really didn't want to hear that. I don't really want his grace to be sufficient for me. I just want him to take it away. I want this suffering to stop. I want things to get better. I want Gary to get better. I want our life to get better. I want y'all to get better. I want this stop. I want the bleeding to stop. But the verse said, Pam. He said, my grace is sufficient. And where do you get the grace? Where do you get the grace? Well, let's say this one. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our weaknesses, our infirmities. But was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us, therefore, I'm in Hebrews 4, 15, 16. So let us, therefore, come boldly. That's the same word that he used where he said you have confidence in your prayers. That word bold there is confidence. It's the very same Greek word. Come confidently, come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and we may find grace to help in time of need. When you are at that point, when he said my grace is sufficient and I don't feel like I'm sufficient. Come boldly. We can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's King James. I put another version down here that said, let us, then the NIV says, let us approach God's throne with great, of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Well, whether it's that version, I'm trying to find help for me or I'm trying to find help for you, it goes both ways. The grace to help you or the grace to have help. I'm going to come boldly to his throne. That's where you get the grace, guys. He just said, come to the throne. Quit being embarrassed. Quit being ashamed. Because you've already got the cross behind you, now you've got the throne right here. That's where you go. 
You go through the cross, but you don't stop just hanging out the cross. God forgive me, God forgive me, God forgive me. He's like, okay, I did that already. I died. Get over to yourself. Now go on over here and get at the throne and get something help so you can help some people. You need to be helped so you can be a helper. I want this church, a lot, most people come in this church have already been saved. They already have the Lord, but they need to be delivered. They need to get to a place where they know they can come boldly and confidently and throw the grace and quit feeling all condemned and I've, I ain't good enough yet, Pastor. You're never going to get good enough. He knew that when he picked you. His grace is sufficient. His love covers a multitude of sins. I don't care how crappy you've had this life. Get in here and learn some stuff so you can go on into the throne of grace. I'm trying to teach y'all some stuff to get to the point where you don't need me anymore. My job is to get you to him. I'm not your Jesus. I'm not your Savior. I'm not your Holy Ghost. I'm to point you to those things. You see, Paul, Paul teaching, that's the whole thing about his letters to the churches. Well, you don't understand when he said, I praise you that I'm giving you all these ordinances, Corinthians. Why was he having to give them all these little rules and ordinances and how to live their life? You'd think these people just got filled with the Holy Ghost. They'd know how to treat their wives. You wouldn't need to say, husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church. Wives, go over here and obey up, honor your husbands. You'd think he'd need to know all that. But you know what the problem was? I found out. I looked at it this week. It jumped out of me. This is still the problem today. Where do I have this down here somewhere? 1 Corinthians 4, 14. He said, I'm not writing. I, I, actually, I had this on the board last week. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. He loved these people. He was talking to these people at the church. He didn't ever have any kids, but he seen them as his sons and daughters. He loved them like a father. He said, he said I, I, I warn you for though you have 10,000 instructors of Christ, you don't have many fathers. I said that last week. There's a lot of people who want to tell you what to do, but not everybody wants to go home with you and feed you and love you and take care of you like a father heart. But in Christ Jesus, I've begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I beseech you to be followers of me. And for this cause, I sent you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, that he'll bring you to remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, those I teach in every church. Now, why, I'm gonna, what, what, why am I reading this right here? What I, oh, that ain't that actually going to hold on. That's not the one I was going to read, but just leave that there for a minute because I'm going to read this to you. It's here somewhere. I know it's in Corinthians too. I jumped over it. It's young breathe for a minute. Well, actually, what he said, let me just find it. I, want, I didn't put it on there. I thought I gave it to y'all, but anyway, he said, he come to him and he said, I'm, I'm speaking to you. He said, I'm speaking to you as carnal. I know I had this down here. He said, I'm having to come to you and teach these things to you because, uh, oh, here it is. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through, 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, but I'm having to speak to you as carnal, even as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, and there, but you weren't able to bear it. And you're neither yet now are you able, for you're yet carnal. And he said, I can tell you're carnal because there's envy and strife and divisions that are among you. So what he's saying is, you, I'm not able to come unto you and speak to you as spiritual people yet. I'm having to give you some ordinances. I'm having to tell you how to act because you've not got to the place. Now, y'all, hang on to this. I told y'all at the end of the service last week where he said, he said, if you would walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. You won't need anybody to tell you don't lie, don't steal, don't lust. You'll just be walking in the spirit and you'll be doing the right things. He said, but when you're carnal, when you're still weak, he said, I'm not trying to shame you, brother. And I just, I'm not trying to shame you. I'm trying to warn you because I'm, can't, I'm having to talk to you. I'm having to tell you what to do, how to act, how to walk. I'm having to tell you as a slave owner to say, that, go treat your slaves right. Well, you think they'd know that. They were still living in a time of slavery. It's not because slavery was right. But he said, if you have slaves, I need to tell you how to treat them. You think they already know that. But you think there's a lot of, in theory, all of y'all should know how to treat one another. In theory, a wife should know how to treat her husband. Husband, how to treat her. You, in theory, we should know that. But the truth is, he said, you're still carnal. I'm not shaming you. I'm just telling you this is where you're at. And I realize this, guys. They'll always have a need for legalistic churches. I always have a need for them. 
I came out, I'm thinking of some of the things I came out of. As a church, I go by and they are filled with cars. And I think, how in the world are those people still go in there when they're this, 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 and this? There's such bondage. But they need the preacher to tell them how long is long, how short is short. Can I go do this? They even have to ask their pastor when they can take a vacation. They're under such control. See, some people are not good to the point where they're walking in the spirit. He said, he, they that walk in the spirit, they're sons of God. Now, y'all need to get this. He's telling this. He's saying, even to Nicodemus, he said, you'll be sons of God. You're already the children of Israel, Nicodemus. You're a ruler among the Jews. You're already a son of Abraham. But he said, when you learn to walk in the spirit, then you'll be a son of God. What does that mean? Sons talking to that Jewish man meant that you're able to, you're mature. That means you're now able to inherit and you're able to, to produce children. You'll get to the point you grow up where you can have some authority. You can be a son because women didn't inherit. Children didn't inherit. It took a son. It took a man. It took a male to the man he was talking to. He understood that. See, people don't understand who Paul was talking to. They get real confused. He was talking to a Jewish leader and said, I want you to become a son of God, not just a son of Abraham, but when you're going all the laws and all the rituals and all that stuff. He goes, you're going to need some laws. All of us need some laws. I need laws to tell me how fast to drive. Laws have their time and place, but at some point I'm mature enough to go, I don't care what that sign says right there. It says I can go 75, but it's got ice out here. I ain't going 75. By law, I could go 75. But it's ice on the ground. I'm really immature and stupid to go, I can do that. I'm just going to do it. How many of y'all heard this one? Just because you can don't mean you should. But at that time, people needed the law. They needed to be under tutors. He said, your children, even an heir has had to be under tutors and, and train when they're little because they don't know how to act. People need the law of the land because they don't know how to act. Right now, this week, 774 Texas laws went into effect. 774 new laws in Texas alone. I thought them 613 laws that Moses gave the people was a lot. That didn't work then. And let me tell you something else. The 774 laws they just passed in Texas. In theory, we should have a safe. We ought to be the oh, utopia. One of the laws that we passed that says every school, it's a shame we have to do this, but every school now will have an armed person on that campus. I think that's a good law. But how many of y'all think the school shootings are going to stop because that law just got passed? People that are the school shooters, they, 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 they're suicidal. They, they plan on dying. They're either going to die by cop, suicide by cop, or they're going to shoot themselves because they're doing it openly. That's part of the plan. I'm just going to take everybody with me I can as I go out. It's not going, now that what can help is there's a shooter or somebody else, like in this room right here, if somebody walked in this church or shooting us, hopefully somebody's got a license to carry in here and they can take them out before they killed many of us. All it'll do is reduce it, but it will not stop it. The law only reduces and controls, but it cannot stop it because only God can legislate the change of our heart. As he told Gary last week, you cannot, or told me in the middle of the night, you cannot legislate love. You can make laws and love. You have 774 laws that tell you that. There's also a law that just got passed that went into act this week. If you, if somebody dies of a fentanyl overdose and they can trace back and find out who manufactured it, who sold that to you, you can be charged as a murderer. It's a law in Texas. Texas gets tough on crime. The truth is, do you think they're going to stop manufacturing drugs today? They're going to manufacture? Is there people going to stop dying from fentanyl today? In theory, they should. I don't want to be a murderer. You're stupid to start with doing it. You're already risking your life. You're already crazy in the, in the system. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, what is wrong with you that you're also manufacturing something that's killing kids in, in middle school? It's, we got, you can't legislate this. In theory, that stuff should work. In theory, the more laws we make, but it doesn't. It's just the best we can do. But there's people right now in church, we can legislate. You need to, you don't watch rated R movies. I don't know about PG-13, but check that one out. See, we need legislation. We try to get people how to live for God. That's what we did. We did the best we could. But that's not going to change you. It's only going to be your heart. Because then when you go on vacation, we wasn't allowed to have televisions because we couldn't be trusted, I guess, with what we were going to watch. But what did you do when you went on vacation? 
you made sure you had some real good TV in that motel. <laughs> we laugh about it, but it was the truth. The heart was right. We were trying to legislate stuff. In theory, that should have helped people. But in reality, it takes it in here. In reality, you're going to learn. It's terrible that we have to learn the lab of life about what it really takes, my friend, and what it's going to take. How many of y'all have learned the things that's changed your life? You learned it in a fiery furnace. He said, every man's work will be tried by fire. Everybody. And it's going to show you something. It's not because I'm trying to consume you and kill you. Oh, I'm mad at you. No, he said, it's going to reveal what was wood, hay, and stubble. The things that don't really matter. It's not bad. It's just, it's just temporal. That's what Bill's going through. It's just temporal. What bad things he was doing. But it, it just, it, you know, those laws that we had, all those rules, we called them the standard and all these tenets of your faith. It's, you know, it's not that it's all bad, but it, at some point it's going to burn all that. I'm going to go, that's because we use that divide each other. We divide each other with you as married divorce. We divide each other. And people get divided on all kinds of stuff. That's not the will of God. He's shaking all that stuff off, guys. He's bringing us down to what the New Testament church was about. It's going to be, I know Jesus and him only. And out of that, I won't need anybody. I won't need to have a legalistic pastor that tell me what to do and what to say and how to act. Paul said, I'm giving it to you right now because you're carnal. You're still carnal, Corinthians. You still divide. You're having a fallout of who baptized you. He said, good Lord, when are you going to grow up? I should be teaching you. You should be teaching others, he said, but you still have need to be taught again. That's where we all are. There's things we need to be taught again. But you can't legislate these things. In theory, they work. But in reality, <laughs> we need to look at the reality. And wherever we are, we know the beautiful reality. God loves me so much. God really is love. He loves me on my worst day. I love that song, my worst day. On my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst, worst day, I'm, we wouldn't have said that. Well, they're probably going to have said this to license to sin. They're going to go out there. You preach grace like that, that greasy grace, pastor. This is going to get my license to sin. They're going to go out there like, well, let's just go ahead and do it. Everybody does it. Let's just do it. Have some fun. I'm like, okay, you can. Paul, so Paul said all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Let them do it. See what happens. I had a pastor tell me one time, look, I appreciate what you're doing. I, I just let people dress any old way. It'd just be horrible. I was like, why don't you just let them dress any old way? Then you know really where their heart is. What do you want them to do? Pretend? That's what we did. We pretend I'm holy because he thought that made us holy. No, at some point, I don't need, just do what you do. It's all right. Let it all, this, I said, let it all hang out. That's not a good way. But it's just like, be real, exposed. That he can heal you. Okay, I'm look at y'all's faces. Y'all getting hungry. It's time to go. <laughs> Paul said, the reason why he told about that other scripture, he said, I need you to be followers of me. He said, in fact, I'm going to send Timothy to help you remember what I told you. The reason why he had to send Timothy and the reason why he said, just follow me, is because they wouldn't at the point they could just follow the Holy Ghost yet. But at some point, they were going to follow the Holy Spirit. And he said, you'll have no need that man teach you. The only thing I need to teach you today is how to hear him. If I can teach you how to get to the throne of grace, then you're going, then that's what happens. You're going to have it. You've got it when you get your own. you got your own. Now you can teach others. Living it by example. I don't know why I wrote it down here today, but I felt like this, I put down the serenity prayer. We say it a lot, and AA says it a lot, but it's such a powerful thing. And I feel like this is where I am today and with what theory, what's not theory, what works. I said, God, grant me the serenity the serenity to accept the things I can't change. Just give me the peace and other some things I just don't know the answers to yet. I can't change. Can't change where we are right now. We had his meeting, his doctor's appointment. We go down to UT Southwestern every few months. They don't have any answers. All these new medicines... Oh, it's, there's hope in there, but Lord, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change right now. Doesn't mean God can't change them. Doesn't mean God can't heal. But the reality is where I am. It ain't happened yet. Whatever you get is in the house today. 
God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, but you have not changed yet. Courage to change the things I can. And I have to say this, it really takes more than courage. There's a lot of courageous people willing to do the dangerous things. So a lot of courageous people want to stop doing that, want to start doing this. They have the courage, but what they don't have yet is the power to change the things. Because the first line of even the 12 steps said, I had to, first of all, recognize I'm powerless. I need a God bigger than me. In reality, in courage, you know, I think it can just have, but I have to have the courage to trust him. That's the courage. It's not the power of positive thinking here. Or pull yourself up by your bootstraps, John Wayne. Men are killing themselves over a John Wayne theory in their head. Real men shouldn't cry. Real men should be able to do this. Real men should have. That is a hogwash. Real men is raw and real and they cry like Jesus cried. Jesus fell down and wept till his tears became as blood, drops of blood. He wept over Lazarus. He wept over Jerusalem. And then he wept at the altar of himself. Dying. The theory of me. Give me the courage to change the kings I can. Knowing that it's going to be him. And the wisdom to know the difference. He said, ask for wisdom, I'll give it to you. Just goes back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In theory, we should be okay alone and be able to do this. And I, and I, can, I can isolate. I told Brother Ken today, I said, when I get quiet, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm so extroverted. When I go quiet, my kids kind of know this. That's when you better get worried. Might be the wrath of Pam fixes to store it and cap it, but whatever it is. We don't do well in isolation. We're never meant to do that. Let me tell you something. That's not a theory. It's a reality that it's not good for man to be alone. The God who made man turn around and said it's not good for him to be alone. We need each other. That's why you're here today. You're not here just because you need a, a message. You can get that on the internet. You're here because we need each other. You need to come into the presence of one another. You always know you're not, you're not sad once you get here. You might be mad, but like, oh, why am I going to church again today? It's a holiday. I can think of all kinds of reasons. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not, you know, you know I already said, I'm, I bless people. But the reality is I need you, not in theory, but in reality. He said, I'm making you a body and I'm warning you not to isolate yourself. Don't forsake the assembling together, even more as you see the days approaching. We need each other more. I need you more. Because we need to be healed so we can be whole and we can go be productive in life and have the joy of the Lord upon our lives. This is a healing place. You may be here for a reason, a season, or a lifetime, but it's a healing place, Justin. He's healing you, Brittany. He's healing you, Mary, Evelyn, each one of you. He's healing us. He's making us whole. Not because I'm sick, but I'm being made whole.